Um, and so we'll just focus on driveways kind of as a uh, case study for the responsibilities through the timeline. OK, so we're going to start at the very beginning, which is the development process. Um, one of the main responsibilities of a producer is identifying um, story ideas that could be a good film. So maybe you're finding ideas. Um, maybe you're generating those ideas on your own. So maybe there's a script that somebody else has written that you think would make a really good movie. Um, I th maybe there is a book or a short story or a play or an article from a newspaper that you're like, that would be a fantastic movie. Your job is to find those stories that you think could make a good film and the ones that you believe in. Um, and I think that that is very important in thinking about developing your own taste creatively of what stories do you want to tell and why do you want to tell them. When you're developing things to produce, you want to find things that you have this deep, visceral connection with because it's going to be a very long process and it's going to be very hard and there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. And so when the going gets tough, at any stage of the process, that kind of deep intellectual and emotional connection to the material is, for me, the thing that like, keeps me going even when it feels like things aren't going to happen on the film. Um, that also means you're finding artists that you believe in, that you're going to be able to advocate for through the entire process. Um, so for Driveways specifically, 10 years ago, I had gone and seen a play in New York City by two writers, Hannah Boss and Paul Thoreen, um, who are currently the creators and showrunners of Somebody Somewhere on HBO. Um, but they had an off-Broadway theater group. They had never written for t TV and film before. And I saw their play, and I was like, oh, they write characters and dialogue so beautifully, they would write a great movie. I went up after the play, and I introduced myself to them. And I was like, I think your plays would make really great films. I would love to stay in touch. Um, we formed friendship and relationship over the years. Uh, they did not want to turn any of their plays into movies. They were like, we disagree with you. Our plays were written as plays. They were meant to be plays. We will never write them into films. And I was like, OK, well, let's talk about an idea that you might have for what could become a movie. So they came in, um, and we sat down. And they didn't really have an idea of what the story could be. They had just kind of latched on to this news story that they'd seen on their local public news that they had both it had both made them it made them both cry and they had this really emotional response to it and they were like the news story was about an eight-year-old boy who lived next to an 85 year old uh, war veteran and they had kind of unexpectedly become best friends and the news story was about the family having to move away and what was going to happen to the boy's friendship with his elderly neighbor it was really the first time the kid had like actually made a friend and that was all they had like that was it they were like the story made us cry but we think there's something in that relationship so over the next two years um, i spent two years developing the screenplay with them and so you know, they went off and spent four to six months working on a first draft, and they came back with this story about um, a single mother and her young son who's like struggling to connect socially. Um, and they had come up with this arc of the story where her estranged sister had passed away, and they were coming to town to clean out her house. And so while the mom, played by Hong Chao eventually in the movie, is discovering, rediscovering the sister that she had lost touch with through cleaning out her sister's house, the boy bonds with Brian Dennehy, who's his elderly neighbor. Um, and at the end of the movie, Brian's going to be moving away for his adult daughter to care for him. Um, but through the relationship, the kid has really kind of found his own sense of identity um, and come out of his shell. It took two years of developing the script. Like, no script on the first draft feels ready to shoot. Um, and sometimes you'll have thoughts on what makes good changes. Sometimes I will give very bad notes, and writers will be like, that is a terrible idea, because they know their story inside and out. But sometimes there are ideas that you can bring to the table um, that, that really work. For example, in the very first draft, at the end of the script, um, Brian Dennehy's character fell and had to go to the hospital. And I, we kind of, I said to them, I was like, I feel like when people go into this movie just seeing like this 85, 90 year old character, people are going to expect that something bad's going to happen to the guy or that he's going to die at the end of the movie. I was like, let's kind of veer away and left turn and get that out of there and really just kind of focus on the relationship. Um, so the second draft, that was gone. Um, we spent, and so a big part of being a producer is knowing those creative elements really well. 
story structure, emotion, conflict, conflict resolution, and really helping to kind of shape narrative arcs and understanding how good stories are told and what makes one satisfying. Um, then after, oh, I, packaging should be second. Packaging is second. <laughs> uh, packaging is kind of the stage where we talk about uh, now that you've got a script, what do you do with it? You've spent two years, sometimes less, sometimes longer. I have scripts that I've been working on since 2015, 2016 with writers. Um, but now that you have a script, what do you do? You kind of move on to packaging. Apologies for the order. Um, this is the phase where a producer kind of jumps into gear building out the team. So if the person who wrote the screenplay isn't a director or going to be directing it themselves, it is the producer's job to hire the director for the movie. It is the producer's job to hire a casting director or find actors to play your roles. Um, it is your job to oversee um, somebody generating the budget and schedule of the movie. Um, it is your job to find financing for the film. And so a lot of times when you're thinking about that as a producer, you're thinking about, okay, how big is the story? How small is the story? How many characters? How many locations can it be shot in? And thinking about what makes sense with like a reasonable budget in that range. Um, we could do a, a semester's long class on all of that, uh, just in and of itself. But the packaging phase is really where you're going through those decisions of who are the people that I'm hiring to direct the movie, add to the cast, and building out the budget and the schedule. And a big part of that is also where do you want to film? Um, there was an article in the New York Times this week about the competition that states are in for creating tax incentives for filming productions to draw production in. And so you're thinking through where can I shoot that makes sense visually for the story and which state might have a really friendly uh, film industry that they've built up through those tax incentives. And is there crew locally that I can hire or am I going to have to spend the money to bring crew in if there's not crew that lives there? This is the phase where you're thinking through all of those decisions. Um, then you move, once you've got your film financed, you move into production. And during production, if you've done your job well, and there are always bumps in the road, but if you've done your job well, production is usually the least busy time in my life because you've got it financed, you've got the schedule, you've got the money, you've got the cast, you've hired your crew, you've got people that you can trust, and there you're just kind of there to make sure that, you know, you're putting out fires as they arise, because they will. Um, but you know, in pre-production, you're helping with location scouting and choosing those locations. You are helping the director hire his department, his or her department heads. Um, so you, that means you're helping pick the production designer and the cinematographer and the costume designer. I'm involved in all of those decisions. Who is going to be our first assistant director? Who is running the set? Um, and those people start to hire their own departments. And all of a sudden, you've kind of got this flow chart, organizational chart of you know, 60 people working on the movie as you've kind of built that out. And during the shoot, you're watching what is being filmed each day. Sometimes you're at the monitor watching it happen in real time. Sometimes you're running around solving problems. So you're watching the footage that night to make sure that everything's kind of feeling good and looking good. Um, and throughout this, the process of production, you're also managing the relationships between the cast and the crew and the filmmaker. And if there are external people like financiers or agents or managers or lawyers or accountants, you're managing and massaging all of those relationships through the shoot too. Um, but like I said, like a major job of a producer is that kind of preparation that goes into making sure that by the time you get to filming, all of that architecture is built. Um, so maybe counterintuitively, counter when the film is shooting is kind of the least busy moment for me because you've kind of got the most people on the film at that stage. Then everybody goes off and you move into um, post and you are still involved very much in the day to day. Um, so for, uh, uh, you are watching every cut in the editing process. You are there when you're doing color correction. You're there when you're doing the sound mix. You help the director hire the composer, and I find myself giving notes on music cues that come in because sometimes it's like, oh, that's like too thuddingly obvious of a music cue. Let's like pull it back, or the music's too subtle here, or even things as like granular as the instrumentation doesn't sound right. Like, what if we tried this with a violin instead of a piano? Like, you you are involved in all of those. So with driveways, you know, once we had the screenplay. 
Um, I had seen Andrew Ahn, who had directed the film, I had seen his first film, Spa Night, and I thought it was absolutely stunning. Um, he, it was a film that he had crowdfunded the money for, um, and he had made it for $200,000, and I thought it was an absolutely subtle and very restrained um, first feature. Uh, a lot of t I use a lot of adjectives to describe first time films, uh, but restrained is not usually one of them because you're like learning and you're really putting yourself out there as a director. And I thought Andrew would be a wonderful choice for this. And so I called Andrew and I said, I have a script I think I'd like you to read. He had been reading things that his agent and manager were sending him for like a year and a half to try to find his next movie and had not liked anything that had come his way. He called me the next day and he was like, I cried in the coffee shop in LA getting, when I got to the end of the screenplay. I want to do this. Andrew had notes that we worked on with Hannah and Paul. Um, we brought on a casting director who found us, Brian Dennehy, um, who wasn't our first choice. We went to Robert Duvall first, but Brian ended up being absolutely amazing. Um, we went to Hong Chow. That was Andrew's first choice for the movie. He didn't think that we would be able to get her because we were making the film for so little money, and it was right after she had gotten her first Golden Globe nomination. But you never know how these things are going to go because her manager called me and said, Hong went and saw spa night in theaters in LA when it came out. She was like one of the three people that saw it. She was like, I will do anything Andrew on wants to direct. And she said yes to the movie without even having read the script yet. Um, so you never know when you're going out to these people like where those connections are going to be and what they've seen. Um, we, the film was shot, was written to be somewhere in the Midwest. Um, but we knew that in upstate New York, there were really strong tax incentives. The state of New York has really great filming incentives, and they actually give you an extra 10% um, if you film upstate away from the city to kind of try to pull production away from the city and benefit the rest of the state. So we started running a budget for upstate New York. We started going out to people that finance movies. I got 80, 85, 90 no's from companies and we were like a week or two away from heading upstate when we got the 91st response, which was a yes from a company that was based in New York and London that finances movies. Um, if it had been like one more week, we would have had to delay the film a year. Um, we knew we needed to film in the summertime because of the boy starring in the movie um, and we wanted to film when school year wasn't going so we could have a little extra time with him. Um, in post-production, we were editing out of New York, worked with a composer that we had worked with like three other times on films. Uh, and you know, you get to the end of the process and you've got a completed film and it's, you're like, how do I get it out into the, mo in, into the world? There's always going to be hiccups. Um, I thought we were a slam dunk for Sundance because Andrew's first film, Spa Night, had played at Sundance, had been given a special jury award, Andrew, uh, all of his short films had played Sundance. He had a close personal friendship with the head programmer of Sundance. Uh, and he was even a mentor for the Sundance Labs every year. I was like, okay, well, this is 100% gonna be a Sundance movie. We submitted it to Sundance while we were still in post-production and we got a no. And it was shocking. It like broke Andrew's heart for a little while, but it's, you know, Sundance is not the be all end all of film festivals. It's not the only place to launch a movie. Um, and so we submitted it to Berlin, um, which is a f the following month after Sundance. Andrew thought we had no shot at getting into Berlin because Berlin had rejected every single thing he had ever made, but Berlin said yes to the movie. Um, and so when we went to Berlin with the film, and there are hundreds and hundreds of film festivals, and some are small, some are focused on specific genres. Um, you can really do your research and think about where does this make the most sense for my movie? Because not every film makes sense for Sundance. Not every film makes sense for New York or Toronto or Cannes. There are wonderful festivals all over the country and all over the world. And that's a really big part of the process as a producer too, is thinking through what is this film about and what's the best audience for it and where do we find that? Um, we brought on a sales agent who sold the film for distribution. We were going to be coming out theatrically in May of 2020. Things changed, um, and Brian Dennehy passed away two weeks before our release date, too, um, which was very sad uh, for all of us. Uh, Lucas, especially the little boy, had forged such a strong relationship with Brian over the shoot. 
um, his parents got him the dog to cheer him up and he named him after um, the character Brian voiced in Ratatouille. Uh, it, was, it was devastating for all of us, but it was the film coming out at that moment in time ended up kind of de facto being this wonderful tribute to the career that he had had as an actor. Um, and so the, the distribution company that we sold it to flipped last minute to a, you know, online only because this was when we were doing kind of virtual theater and virtual screenings at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, and then it has ended up, it's bounced around from streamer to streamer. Um, films can like get sold and resold to different streamers after, you know, you'll sell it to Netflix for 18 months and then once that's up, you'll sell it to Amazon for 18 months, and then you'll sell it to Hulu for 18 months. And so like, it's bounced around from streamer to streamer um, since then. Uh, so you're really involved, like going back to like the day I saw the play of Hannah and Paul's in 2012 to the film coming out virtually in May of 2020, like you really can see just how involved the producer is on a granular level, but also building up that infrastructure um, throughout the entire lifespan. Um, this is a behind the scenes still from We Grown Now playing tonight. Um, we got to film in the Art Institute of Chicago, which was just an absolute dream come true. Um, it's, it is kind of a daunting, overwhelming job. And when I read the Christine, who came and spoke, she has a wonderful book on producing, and I read it and I was like, oh my God, like this is so much work. There's so much responsibility on the shoulders of a producer. How do I even get there? And like I said, every single person has like a different path, and I can talk about my path specifically. There's kind of two main routes if you want to be in the industry proper. One of those is coming up through uh, production on set. So a lot of times you'll start as like a set PA, um, and then people mistakenly think that you kind of work your way up through the PA system and stay working on set. But if you want to be a producer, um, what I would recommend doing is maybe getting a job as a set PA, but then moving from set to being the um, office PA. Because the office PA is the one that's actually working um, more closely in touch with the producer, with the line producer who's managing the budget. Um, and the, off, the office PA reports to the production coordinator. And so once you've had a couple of experiences as office PA, you'll be at the point where you can kind of take that step up to production coordinator. Production coordinator then, after you've had a couple of those jobs, you get to production supervisor, and then production manager, and then kind of line producer and creative producer. And if you are somebody who is like, I want to be on set as much as possible, I want to spend my professional life on set, that's a real kind of route to go. And during that time, you might not be producing your own work, or maybe you're producing friends' shorts or friends' films on the side while you're getting these experiences on set. You're also developing your own sense of taste and looking for those things that you want to, looking for those artists that you want to champion and those stories that you want to tell. Um, the route I took, I'm not a person that loves being on set. Like, I'll admit that in this room. I just, it's like the, it's my, it's my least favorite part of the process. I think because like it's, it's when I'm least busy, like I like being busy um, and I love the kind of development of story. I love the kind of adding people to the team and building that up. Um, I love the overarching creative process, but I don't love being on set. I do it now because it's part of my job, um, but it's not, it's not my favorite part of the process, um, even though that's kind of where the magic is for a lot of people. Um, so if, if the kind of on-set route is one that's not appealing to you, there kind of is like an in, within the industry executive route where you can take that will take you where you want to be. Um, a lot of times you'll start out as an assistant or in the mailroom of one of the talent agencies. Um, these are jobs mostly in New York or LA, but also exist in Chicago, Atlanta, some in Nashville, London, um, Vancouver and Toronto, but New York and LA primarily, um, where you're getting an assistant job, like an entry level assistant job at an, a talent agency or maybe a talent management company. Um, and this is where I think that you want to spend time thinking about what do you really love? Like what are the things that you love and why do you love them and what do you want to make? Because the biggest thing as a producer is like you, there's a gazillion things that you could tell. There's a gazillion ideas and stories. Which ones do you want to be a part of and why? So, the, so advice that I give people at this stage where you're kind of 
emerging from school and getting your entry level job in the industry is really learn which companies out there are making movies and which companies make which types of films and which what companies out there are the ones that are making the films you like the most because you're going to want to find jobs at the places that are making things that you really believe in. And oftentimes um, the kind of ladder that route after you have an assistant job the kind of first junior level executive position is oftentimes called a creative executive. Um, and then a creative executive moves up to director of development, director of development to vice president, and then most times after vice president you're getting like a head of production job um, where you're, I, you're the one in charge of identifying the material and developing it and producing it. That was the route I took. Um, I moved to LA not knowing anything I had watched Entourage, and so I thought like being Lloyd at the agency was what I was supposed to do. Um, and so I uh, applied at all of the agency mail rooms and ended up getting the job. It was, you know, you're delivering mail and picking up salads and driving clients around town. But from the mail room, you get promoted to be an assistant to an agent. And then um, I knew I didn't want to be a talent agent, and so I started looking around at what companies made movies I loved um, and finding a way to meet people there and networking, and so that when a job became available at Focus Features, I applied for that assistant job. Um, and I got that job. Um, one year later, Universal fired all of us and shut down the New York headquarters, but I was like, I'm gonna be at Focus the rest of my career. And so after I had had that job as the assistant at Focus Features, I went to Ben Stiller's production company where I was high. I got my first job as a creative executive. Um, and then I went to the Weinstein Company as a director of development. Again, another session. Um, and uh, I worked my way up there. But, the, uh, but James Seamus, who is my business partner at Symbolic Exchange, had been the CEO of Focus Features. Um, he wrote Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and, and The Ice Storm, and produced Brokeback Mountain. Um, and we had just forged a very close bond. Um, and he had been fundraising for a movie with Logan Lerman um, that was going to be his first directing debut. And that was when he, we were catching up. And he was like, you know, I want to start a small company, and I want to find somebody to you know, really find and develop emerging voices. If I do that, do you want to come do that with me? Um, and so I, I joined him to start the company. I would say, you know, it's a lot of fields like, you know, accounting, like somebody might get their CP, you know, uh, become a CPA and be an accountant at the same firm for 20 or 30 years. A lot of times in the film industry, when you're going to make that move up to the next job, whether it's assistant to creative executive or creative executive development, director of development, you're moving companies. There is movement all over the place all the time. It's n almost never like a vertical, just one shop. You, you're looking for those jobs and you're kind of finding the places that you want to work and the people you want to work with and you're moving constantly. Most people I know who have been in the film industry have worked at three, four, five, six, seven companies on, in under 10 years because you're really finding those opportunities to move up. A big part of being a creative producer while you're going through those paths, whether it's kind of the executive path within the industry or the production path on set, is just consuming media. Um, like I said, you really want to watch, 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 watch a ton of movies because you really want to develop a very clearly defined sense of taste. Because people will ask you, what do you want to make? And if you can have like a very kind of bite-sized, definable, articulable answer to that question, um, the more you watch, the easier it will be to kind of define that for yourself so that you can define that for others. Um, watching as much as you can also helps you really get a sense of like what makes a movie good and why, what makes a movie bad and why. What do I like? Why do I like it? Um, I also recommend that people read the kind of daily newspapers, I mean now everything's online, but the kind of daily trades which are like Deadline and Variety and Hollywood Reporter um, and IndieWire and Vulture and I'm reading, I'm checking all of those five to ten times a day. Um, the more you read those websites, the more you will get a very clear understanding of how the industry operates because in those articles you'll see the names of the companies and the people like who is selling movies, who is making films, who is distributing them. And in those articles in Hollywood Reporter or, or Variety, you'll also get a sense of like, oh, this person is represented by this agent at this agency and the deal was negotiated by this person. So you'll start to see those connections and how the industry is kind of structured operates, the more you read the kind of journalistic 
uh, public uh, outlets that, that cover the entertainment industry. Um, it's a very daunting job because of the kind of myriad of responsibilities that sit on your shoulder. Um, but like I said, because everybody, everyone's path, everybody's individual path is so specific, every single step you take is an opportunity to learn a different aspect of the job that ultimately becomes the all-encompassing job of creative producer. Um, I think that one of the things that's so wonderful about it, obviously the business is um, in a moment of complete turmoil because of how streaming has upended the industry, which, pit, which the kind of big companies still haven't really totally figured out um, because of the pandemic, because of the strikes last year. There might be another wave of strikes from the crew this year. So the industry is completely tumultuous, but I think what is the most satisfying about being a creative producer is you get to choose who you're gonna advocate for and why. We're the torchbearers of the industry. So the movies we choose to make, the filmmakers we choose to support and make sure that we're working every day to get their work made, that's what changes the industry and moves things forward. Um, and so what we choose to make pushes everything, uh, everything forward and makes that change. Um, and I know I just word vomited at you with a lot of information with a lot of steps and different jobs and tasks. Um, but I hope it was a little bit enlightening in terms of what is under the umbrella of this kind of very broad job title, but also why it matters. And um, maybe, hopefully, a little inspirational um, like it was for me sitting in not this room, but a different one 18 years ago. Um, but I wanted to, because it's a lot of information, I wanted to leave a good amount of time for questions if you had any of them, um, and happy to kind of talk through anything uh, that you might might want to know. Sure. Do you think the skills to be a creative producer are a lot different from the skills to be like a creative, like a director, screenwriter, cinematographer, or Yes, like absolutely. Because uh, those roles are more purely creative, whereas with a producer, even though I'm overseeing the creative aspect, it's also my job to make sure that the movie is staying on time and on budget. And there is tension in that. Like, film and TV is the, the largest global industry in our history of mankind where art and commerce are really intersecting. And those two things don't mesh. And so there is an inherent tension in the job of being a producer where you have to protect that kind of creative flame of the movie while also being like, OK, these are the resources I have to make this and figuring out how to do it. Um, and how to do it on schedule. Um, whereas like a director or a cinematographer or a costume designer or an editor has a very kind of specialized creative role um, on the film and you're the one telling them that we can't afford that. <laughs> uh, I have a film that's gonna be shooting in May and June this spring and it was written for Los Angeles. And even though the film industry is centered in LA, California is very oddly, very unfriendly to film production and has terrible tax incentives um, and has lost a lot of production in other states and the filmmaker desperately wanted to make the movie in Los Angeles. He grew up in LA, he wrote the story for LA, he based all of the characters on people he knows and places he goes to um, and we've kind of just come to the point within the past four weeks where we've just said like we for what we're going to get to make the movie, we cannot afford to shoot in Los Angeles. Um, and so we are gonna shoot in Vancouver, um, and we've recently run a budget for Vancouver. Canada has wonderful tax incentives. Uh, and because the dollar is so weak there, you basically get like an extra quarter on every dollar. Um, and we're gonna shoot in Vancouver, and we're in the process now of deciding um, we're looking at pictures of locations from early location scouts and we're deciding do we want to just move the story within the screenplay to be set in the Pacific Northwest or do we want to try to cheat Vancouver for Los Angeles and maybe just have our director and our cameraman do a weekend in LA getting exterior shots that we can plug into the edit and try to trick it. So we're at that point now where we're kind of making that decision. Um, uh, along the way. But yeah, it's very, you know, that tension is always in there for a producer and um, a lot of times the uh, people who have those purely creative roles aren't feeling that until we step in and, and say what might be achievable within the reality of the picture. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I knew I wanted to work in film, but I also knew that I didn't have like a creative, I mean, I have a very creative job, but I knew 
in my soul that I would be an awful writer or director. I have never had the impulse to do either of those jobs. You'll meet producers who like have scripts that they've written on the side because they hope to like write or direct one day. I know deep within me that I would be awful at either. I've never tried to write a single word on a single page of a story. It's not my job, but I really like a leadership role. I really like being with something from the generation of the idea through the completion of it into reality. And I really like being kind of at the center of the web of people managing um, the process and the relationships and everything. And so that's really why being a producer was a great, uh, a great fit for me. Where I still get to touch the creative, you know, you're giving notes on the script, you're giving notes on the edit. Um, you're helping hire the creative people and, and thinking about who's the right fit for the movie. Um, but I'm not the one that has to be the kind of in the driver's seat for the creative elements. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Um, so you talked about how with Driveway that the script had been, you spent a couple years developing it with the writers before Andrew came on, but I know that with We've Grown Now, uh, it was directed by the writer of the script. So I was just curious if, um, like what the difference is in your job working with like a writer-director versus having multiple creative voices and like one is easier or harder, just yeah. Yeah, it's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, find, I actually really like working with writer-directors because I kind of like that singularity of voice and vision. There's like a consistency. But I think really interesting things come from when there are different writers and directors because when Andrew came on board, he had uh, notes on the screenplay. Um, Hong's character was really kind of less clearly defined and had a less central narrative arc to the story. Um, and Andrew really wanted to bring that character to the center of the movie. And a lot of his notes centered around kind of bringing her into the forefront um, of the film. Um, whereas with Min Hall, Min Hall Baig, who is the writer director of We Grown Now, um, I had been contacted uh, by her agent with the screenplay. Um, and I met with her. And because it was about two nine-year-old boys growing up in um, Cabrini Green in Chicago, and I had taught second and third grade. I read the script, and I was like, I know these kids. Like, I know these kids. And I called Min Hall, and I said, like, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Um, uh, we still, once we set the project up with our financier, um, We Grown Now was made more kind of within the industry proper than independently financed and sold. Um, again, like probably a completely different session. But um, even though we set We Grown Now up with two proper studios, um, participant uh, uh, which made Judas and the Black Messiah, uh, and Roma, and Spotlight. Per we set it up with Participant, and Sony came on board um, as a financing partner. So even though we were within the system, every time you add people to the team, they have notes too. And so Participant and Sony spent two years with me and Minhal developing the screenplay too. Um, and I think Minhal ended up writing like four more drafts of the script over those two years before we ended up going to production. So the development process ended up kind of still being the same. Um, but with people who are writer-director, oftentimes um, the script will read differently because the writer is thinking about the choices they would make as a director, and you kind of see that reflected in the pages. Um, and there is a more kind of consistency of voice because it's the person who's going to be on set directing the words. Yes. I say just go out and do it. Um, I have pretty strong feelings about graduate film schools. Um, it works for some people, uh, and graduate film programs will sell you very flashy. This is what our alumni have gone on to do. Um, come give us $100,000 and then spend $50,000 on your short films. And if you do that, you, know, you become Ryan Coogler, because look at what he did. Um, and that, that works for some people, but that is like winning a lottery. Um, I think that just going out and doing the work and finding the opportunities is just as much school as film school itself is. Um, I thought I wanted to go for a graduate degree in producing. There are some schools that do offer graduate um, producing programs. Um, NYU has one, AFI has one, Chapman in Orange County, USC, UCLA. Um, I applied to all those programs because I thought that I needed to do that to kind of learn how to be a producer and get a job in the business. Um, I got rejected three times from USC's producing program. 
um, and ended up moving to Los Angeles. And I got the job in the mailroom at UTA, where, again, this was 14 years ago, so we were making $10 an hour. Um, I got the job in the mailroom, and a woman who was starting the same day with me had just graduated that spring from the program that I had been rejected from three times. And I was like, oh, I just saved myself like $125,000. <laughs> uh, and my $10 can go towards like a, a half of a sandwich, and, and hers has to go back towards paying off this massive loan. Um, so I, my philosophy is like to kind of just go out and do the work and find your people and find the other uh, opportunities for yourself. But if you can make the graduate film system work for you, great. Um, but I think just go in with open eyes uh, about um, what, what is being promised. Because, you know, they, at school you can't be taught, like, how to manage a personality relationship with a director or an actor. Like, that is just done by doing it. Um, so I would say it's something to consider, but be clear-eyed about. They're somewhat involved. So um, on driveways, for example, the writers came up and visited set a couple of times throughout the production. Um, there was a moment where we realized um, there was something that like we were within the scene and we realized something wasn't making sense. And we called them and we were like, can you like really quickly write different dialogue for this scene? Um, uh, the Writers Guild, the union that represents writers, is very protective of other people writing anything that the actors are going to say. So it's not like you can just be like, hey, Hong Chao, say this thing. Like, the writers have to be the one to write, her, so, uh, write it. So they're involved in the process. They came up to visit set. Um, we gave them access to the dailies, so they were watching what we were filming every day and seeing what we were doing. Um, and Andrew, who directed it, is very open-hearted and collaborative. And so like he included them very much through that process. And even in the edit, um, he didn't want to show them his first cut because he <laughs> didn't feel like it was far enough along yet. But uh, a couple of months into the process, when he felt like he had a cut that was strong enough to share with them, he reached out and said, can you come into the edit? I want to show you the movie, and I really want to get your feedback and notes. Um, so, you know, obviously, the development of the script is when they're most involved. But yes, they were certainly involved in production and post-production, too. Both. Both. You kind of answered the question. Uh, it's both. Uh, it, is, it starts with research. So like I said, in like Variety and Holly Reporter and Deadline, you know, it will say in the articles about movies who financed the film. And so I will keep a running log of companies who are kind of actively financing. And then a lot of times I will either find somebody I know who knows somebody who works there for an introduction. But if I can't get that, I'll reach out cold, and I'll pick up the phone and call, or I'll send them an email, and I'll say, hey, I'm taking out this new project. Can I get 10 minutes of your time to pitch you the story and share the script with you? Um, and so it's, it's, it is really a mixture of both. Um, would you say that in, in those that have purely creative roles, that it follows a similar sort of like emotionless corporate up, like upper mobility process from your experience talking um, no, it's really a, a set, it's like more the kind of set process. So with, if you want to be a cinematographer, a lot of times you'll start as like a camera PA, and then you'll climb the ladder just within the department leading towards cinematographer. Um, at, if you want to be an editor, a lot of times you'll get a job as like an apprentice editor, um, and then you'll become an assistant editor, and then you'll become an editor. And so there's not as much of that I'm having to work at a company owned by Universal thing as there is in producing. And for directing, it's like, I, I say just like go out and make stuff, like just go make things and get the work out in the world. Um, but also having time on set can be so helpful because I think, I think a quality that people a lot of times don't think about when thinking about good directors is an understanding of what, what makes a set run well. Because uh, being on set with eight, like 100 people doing 100 different jobs to the kind of first glance looks like completely total chaos. 
um, but it actually is very controlled because everybody has a very a specialized and assigned task. And so I actually think that for directors, getting experience as a PA is just wildly valuable because you get that understanding of how a set runs and what makes a set run well and what makes a set run poorly. Um, and the director is really the one who kind of sets the tone for the atmosphere on set. And so being able to see that, both positive and negative, is, is a massive uh, learning opportunity as well. Uh, but no, it's, it's much more kind of in the creative realm, definitely. Yes. Um, so a lot of times a production company will have uh, an overall deal somewhere, which means that you have the obligation to show that company your projects first. But if they say no, you are free to take the projects elsewhere to try to get them made. Um, in those overall deals, you're kind of given overhead for salary and office space um, and, and development money um, to kind of keep to sustain you between productions. Um, for producers who are truly independent, um, it's, it's tricky because um, development fee, you know, fees for the development process, writers make money when they're writing the screenplay, but producers don't get development fees. Um, it, is, it is something that like producers are trying to fight for, but we're also the only person on the call sheet not represented by a union. Um, producers have tried to unionize three times over the past 70 years, and um, the Department of Labor says no every single time because we're considered management. Um, so, But we're the only people on the call sheet that does not have guaranteed rates, that don't have health insurance, um, that don't have pension and uh, health and welfare fringe benefits. Uh, it's a, it's, so you end up getting paid when the film goes into production, typically, because the producer's fee is baked into the budget of the overall movie. So, it, um, so you know, it's either being at a company that has those overhead deals where there is actual salary to kind of sustain through, or this is why I'm you know, not developing only one movie at a time. I, you know, I, you, some people have more bandwidth for the development process and can develop 15, 20 things at the same time. Knowing my own bandwidth, I tend to keep between five and 10 things active at all times because if I was putting my eggs all in one basket, it might get to the point where things start getting dicey financially because there's no guarantee that a script is ever gonna get made. Um, and so I keep like five to 10 things in active development at all times to try to have one to two things that are getting made each year. You talked about some of the challenges of the industry, just like about the influx of not really knowing where to go in the screening model. But as like the mid-budget movie seems to kind of be disappearing, how has that kind of changed the creative process for you? Because like uh, some of the things are focused in the uh, the Lee movies wouldn't get budgets today. So how right. Change and how do you identify something that's being? I read everything with an eye to how expensive I think it might be. Um, if and, and a big part of reading a script is not just do I believe in this creatively, but do I think I can get this made? Because I don't want to commit to producing something if I'm not going to be able to get the project made. So I'm thinking very strategically when I read something about like, okay, I think I can do this for two million. I know I can go out and raise two million dollars for a movie, or um, you know, I think this is a 10, 15, 20 million dollar movie, and this is going to demand studio support. And so how do I start? seeding those relationships and introducing the director to places so that when we're ready to put it together. Um, but yes, very much so, those kind of mid-budget features have fallen away and so um, you never really think, there are kind of dead zones in budgets that don't happen as much anymore. Um, but I love those mid-budget movies. They're getting made outside of the states right now. Um, and so I've kind of shifted. So I've, in America, I've either got very big things that would be studio movies in development, um, uh, or I have very small things that I feel confident that I can get independently financed. Um, but with the mid-budget movies, I'm actually kind of shifting a lot of those projects on my development slate to being British projects um, and finding British producing partners that can help access British money um, because a lot of those mid-budget range movies are getting made still in the UK and Europe and, and finding ways to make those there since I can't get them made here. Hi. Um, Hi. With, I have a question. 
question, and then I saw someone here has a question. I want to sure. make sure it's in Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. Um, my question was, what was the book that you found was really helpful to you? Oh, my you God. Uh, I don't remember the title of it, It's but it's by Christine Vachon, V-A-C-H-O-N. I think she's... I think she, uh, yes, she's the president of Killer Films, um, and uh, V-A-C-H-O-N. She I think she's written two books on producing. Okay. Um, they were remarkably helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I have, I have it in the Everyone who, <laughs> yeah, every, it's like one of those that everybody's read. Um, yes, she's, and she's an absolute icon and terrifying and <laughs> wonderful, and I love her. Thank uh, you. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, Besides income structure, what would you say are some of like the major differences between working with a creative producer under like a major studio as opposed to independent uh, filmmaking? Yeah, the nice thing about working under a major studio is that there's more resources, both like for your own kind of lifestyle and for the types of movies that you're developing. But um, working at a major studio, you're kind of beholden to the mandate of whatever that company is, and that can change. Like if you look at the movies Netflix is making now versus what Netflix is making, what was making in 2018, they're wildly different creatively in terms of slates of films. And so um, companies that have overall deals at Netflix have had to shift the kinds of movies that they're making. And you know, I have friends who had those kinds of deals who are now developing things specifically for, oh, we want you know, YA romance, and having to find those things to kind of service those deals. Um, being at a smaller company or kind of truly independent, like we are at the moment, uh, the thing that I really love about it is that total crea creative autonomy. So it's finding people like Andrew on who did drive, the movie I'm about to start shooting, the movie of Vancouver, Andrew's directing that too. So we're like continuing our relationship together. So it's finding people like Andrew, finding people like Kitty Green who did The Assistant, um, finding those filmmakers uh, that you really believe in and having the ability to actually work with them because you know whatever they wanna make, you're not beholden to some mandate that you have to kind of adhere to within the studio system. It is, I mean, it's creative success and financial success. I think creative success is, did we make something that is the best version of the director's vision and what was on the page? Um, and sometimes you get to the end of the process and you're like, oh, this is not, like I've made things that aren't good and I know that. <laughs> and sometimes there are things that I'm like, this turned out exactly kind of how um, Min Hall envisioned it. Um, and I'm very proud of that creatively. And you know, and that's like, did people respond to it? Um, did audiences respond to it? Did critics respond to it? Um, and then the financial success is, you know, did we make our investors their money back, point blank? Because yes, like again, that kind of creative and commerce tension that exists through the entire process exists in success for producers too. Like is it creatively successful, but did we earn the money back for the people who invested in the movie? Um, and I would say like, you know, two thirds of the movies that I've made at Symbolic Exchange have been uh, financially successful, and a third have not, but have made m m you know made 50 to 100, you know 50 to 90 percent of the investment back so far. But even the ones from 10 years ago are still generating income um, from you know international sales and, and streaming, and um, that m number might go up as more kind of become profitable. Um, but it, yeah, it is that like is there creative success? But did we make our investors their money back? Yes, yes. Um, sometimes I'll sell, we'll sell the film ourselves, especially if it's like a really low micro budget movie. Um, Kitty Green's uh, hybrid documentary, Casting John Binet, um, which we made in 2017, um, we made that film and sold it to Netflix for four times the budget. And we just sold it to Netflix directly. We thought we had something like very weird and interesting and cool. And so we cut a two minute sizzle reel of footage together and sent it around and uh, we got a call on a 4th of July weekend from Netflix for an offer four times the budget of the movie. Um, sometimes with a film that's larger, you want that institutional support. So we will partner with sales agents, people who specialize in acquiring completed films and selling them to distributors, both here in North America and internationally. Um, uh, 
And so on driveways, we had um, an the agency where Andrew w was represented as a director came on board to sell the film in North America. And we brought out, uh, on a company that specialized in kind of smaller independent titles um, out of America, but specializing in selling them internationally. So we brought on two companies to help us with that. Oh, sorry. Um, I was going to ask, uh, is there a, like a sharp divide between being a creative producer for documentary versus fiction? I mean, is that something you feel like you're interested in doing, or is it like you're kind of significant difference? Documentaries take even longer. <laughs> uh, documentaries take even longer. Uh, I think, yeah, documentaries are, I mean, documentaries can be very tough and tricky because the budgets of documentaries are always, you know, a fraction of, of what a narrative film can be. Um, and just like narrative film, the kind of appetite for documentaries in the marketplace ebbs and flows. Like last year, in 2023, out of Sundance, you know, a company that specializes in selling documentary films, you know, Sundance was in January and in April they told me we still have sold zero of our documentaries from Sundance. Um, and so like last year was this like just bust year for documentary producers, but this year um, documentaries were all the kind of biggest sales titles at Sundance other than a couple of the narrative films. So everybody's like documentaries are back. Um, yeah, you're working kind of, kind of on a smaller scale and I, th I would say there's probably more people on the team from the very beginning too because you're working with researchers and archivists and, uh, and, and it's like a more of a kind of development team. Um, and then I think editing documentaries is much harder than editing narrative films because with kind of a, with a narrative film, you've got the script and then you filmed the script. And so you kind of are going into the edit you, with the pieces of the puzzle. You, you've kind of got the picture on the box of the puzzle of what direction you're walking in. Um, and a lot of times with documentary, you find yourself with hundreds, if not thousands of hours of footage and you have to kind of find the story structure in the editing process, where in narrative film you really are finding that structure uh, in the script phase. So, I, like I find that, like documentary producers, like I that is a, an incredibly difficult job, and I am so in awe of people that can do that because I think I would look at the footage when you move into the edit and be like, where do you begin in finding this? Um, so maybe one day, but I I don't feel confident enough yet for it. I am pretty genre agnostic. I think great stories can come from any genre. Um, I am budget agnostic. Some companies are like, we make movies in this range, or we make action movies. I'm, I'm pretty budget and genre agnostic. Um, I'm really like a filmmaker driven person. So what that means is I'm looking for a kind of clear identifiable vision and voice um, on the page that I feel like I respond to both emotionally and intellectually. Um, and finding a relationship with that person. Um, a lot of times when you like meet a filmmaker, you'll be like, I'll produce your movie, and you're like getting married from a blind date, and that can lead to tricky things. Um, so I, like with Andrew, like I spent a year and a half becoming friends with him before I ever even sent him the script for Driveways because I like to forge that relationship because I want to know that the person I'm like really going to be, and it's not on every film that, that it ends up that way, but I really, try to find people whose vision and voice I believe in and somebody that I can have a positive relationship with outside of the film as well. Um, in terms of thinking about audience, I definitely do think about potential audience for every film. I think um, if something has relatable characters, relatable themes, and again, these can be in any genre, but if there's relatable characters and relatable themes and relatable struggles, um, regardless of budget or genre, like people are gonna respond to that. And m that first gut check is when I'm reading something of like, did I respond to it? Like, did I have some kind of reaction to that script? Sometimes like a script will get under my skin and I'll find myself thinking about it like a week or two later. Other times I'll get to the end of a screenplay and like an hour later I couldn't tell you what it was about. Um, and so like I'll have that like check in with myself of like what am I, what's, what is stuck with me and why is that sticking with me and is that something I need to follow and explore potentially being a part of this process? Because I think if something's gonna resonate 
with me, at some point it's going to resonate with some slice of an audience. Um, that's not a thousand percent batting average of, uh, of success for sure, but I think it's like if it resonates with me, it's going to resonate with at least some other people um, out there.